Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, our webinar today, we're going to look, be looking at solar applications and uh, solar collectors in TracePro. And we're going to be looking at modeling, analyzing, and opti optimizing them. Uh, this is going to be somewhat of a high-level webinar in that I'm not going to go into a lot of details on each specific topic I talk about, but it's, it's more to show you some of the capabilities that are in TracePro uh, that a lot of people may not know are there. So with that, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name's Dave Jacobson. I'm the Senior Application Engineer here at Lambda Research, uh, and I'll be your presenter for today. The format for our webinar is going to be a presentation. Uh, it might go a little longer than 25 or 30 minutes, uh, hopefully not too long today. Uh, and then we'll follow that up with a question and answer session. Uh, and please feel free at any time during the webinar to enter your questions using the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel. And then we'll address all the questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, one thing to note, we are recording this webinar. So the it, in about a day or so, we'll have a recording of this available on our website uh, if anybody wants to go back through it. Uh, before we get started, just some little bit of information here for some additional resources dealing with TracePro and some of our other programs. Uh, we do have webinars and tutorial videos located on our website. Uh, this is actually where you'll find this webinar in a day or so, uh, both for TracePro, Rayviz, and Oslo. Uh, we also have tutorials for TracePro and Rayviz. And then information on, on our upcoming training classes can also be found on our website. So a quick introduction to what we're going to look at today. The topics we're going to cover, we're going to talk about setting up and modeling a solar collection system in TracePro. I'll kind of go through some of the basics, um, you know, just some of the properties to apply, how to set up the sources. And then I'm going to jump into the solar emulator tool in TracePro. And we're going to use that to analyze the performance of the system, the solar collector system, uh, at different times and locations. Uh, for this time, we'll, I'll just show you how to change the location, but I'll limit it to just a single location for the demo. Uh, we'll talk about solar tracking using the solar emulator. And I'll show you how you can set that up quite easily. Uh, then we're going to jump over after a few different things in the solar emulator, and we're going to look at the interactive optimizer in TracePro. Now, we have a lot of webinars and videos um, for attending, I mean, sorry, a lot of optimi a lot of videos and webinars on our interactive optimizer on our website. Uh, but we're going to, I'll show you how to set up a solar collector, how to set up some of the, the tools there. And one thing I want to show uh, to kind of end this, the session today is the ability to use the optimizer to set up a solar collector or a system using multiple sources. So for example, to, to set up a fixed collector uh, that's optimized for different times of the day to try to best optimize it for her overall performance. And then, as I said, we'll wrap it up with a question and answer session. So once again, as we go through the, through the, the webinar, uh, we'll be asking, or I'll try to remind you about adding in questions uh, and sending them in as we go along. So let's talk now about modeling solar collectors in TracePro. I created for this you know, a sample workflow. Uh, first thing we'd talk about, we'd create the model either in TracePro or import it from CAD. Uh, this could be an SAT, a STEP, or an IGES file. Uh, you could also make it, like I'll show in a little bit, you could make the file in or the system in um, the interactive optimizer in TracePro as well. Then we go through and apply properties, such as surface and material properties, uh, define a source. We need a light source. We need the sun in the model. Run a ray trace and analyze the results. So it's a very similar process to doing sort of a, any other ray trace in TracePro. Set up your model, apply your properties, define your sources, and run your ray trace. Uh, this is an example we're going to look at here in just a few seconds. Um, it's a simple, you know, sort of an involute type collector. We're going to have a sun source set up at a distance, and we're going to be having the rays hit this tube or detector here. 
So with that, I'm actually I'm going to jump over and I'm going to show you how we could do that directly in Trace Pro, just really how simple the process is. And a lot of today's webinar is going to be demo as opposed to slides. So I'm going to open up Trace Pro here, and here's that model. Uh, in this case, I made this shape in our interactive optimizer, but it could very easily have come from, you know, made in Trace Pro or made in a CAD program. But right now, there's no properties applied. So if I ran a ray trace, the light's going to go right through this collector. It's not actually going to do anything. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to pick my concentrator or my collector here. I'm going to select it, and I'm going to right-click, go to Properties, and I'm going to apply a surface property. This is the reflective coding, the mirror coding. I'm going to use a surface property, and then I'm going to scroll down, and I'm going to pick Mirror, the property. Click Apply. Uh, if anybody's interested in what makes up one of these properties, if you don't know it, you can click this View Data button here. And it'll open up the, in this case, the Surface Property Editor. And we can see this mirror coding, this mirror property is 5% absorption, a little bit less than 95% specular reflection, and about 0.13% scattered reflection. So it's, it's a really good mirror. Uh, but it's the one I picked for this example here. Okay. Click Apply in case I forgot to. Now, one little sort of trick I used there is that if I, I applied that surface property to the entire object, so that means every surface on this object now has that same property applied to it. Uh, so you could easily go in and change surface properties if you want. Uh, but in this case, I want all the surfaces to have the same property. And I'm going to do similar to here. They're going to select the detector. But this time, instead of a mirror property, I'm going to apply Perfect Absorber. Okay. So that's our model set up. Um, the next step is we need to set up a source. And we're modeling the sun in this case. So, so there's two ways I'd go about that typically. One would be I could use a grid source. Um, and I'm going to click here on Source. And I'm going to go up and I'm going to set up a grid source. Uh, grid source, if you haven't used it in Trace Pro, is a flat two-dimensional grid of points uh, that'll allow you to model you know, a light source. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this on here. And I can turn objects on and on, sources on and off, using this little uh, green check red X. But I'm going to turn it on and then double click it. And I'm using a rectangular grid source in this case. My half height or half width is 37 millimeters because my, my collector is about 74 millimeters, 75 millimeters wide. And my half width for X is 250 because the overall length of my collector is 500 millimeters. I have my grid pattern set to random with 10,000 or 100,000 rays in a radiance illuminance value of 100 th of a of 1000 watts per meter squared so roughly the the solar irradiance at the surface of the earth and i placed it 500 millimeters above the origin along the positive y axis and if i just look at this view of the model here it's the grid source is actually going to be right there that red box uh, my beam setup when I come over to the second tab, I can pick a beam setup of solar for the angular profile, which is great. It's going to give me that roughly plus or minus quarter degree that sunlight has. And just as a simple wavelength in this case, I picked, you know, mid-visible, 0.5461 microns. Um, so we're tracing green light, but you could trace anything from, you know, UV to near IR, mid IR type ranges, whatever you're interested in in your particular system. So with that set up, I could run a ray trace. I'm going to click my ray trace button here. Uh, I'm going to stay in analysis mode. I want to see the rays. Click ray trace. And we'll let this run through. It's taking a few seconds to compute the voxels and analyze the system. And there we go. So I'm overfilling a little bit. I've got some light leaking past my 
detect my collector, but that's okay. Uh, first thing I like to do when I finish up a ray trace is use ray sorting. Uh, so what I can do here is I can go to model and on my detector, I named the outer surface of the detector. I called it receiver. Uh, we'll actually use this name again a little bit here as well, but I can go analysis, ray sorting, and just show the rays that are hitting that particular surface. So it simplifies my model down a little bit, but I really want some information. Um, so for example, here I can go to analysis, irradiance, illuminance maps, and I can see the absorbed flux on that surface. Um, the intensity, not the intensities, the irradiance values there. I can also see down here the total flux, the flux divided by emitted flux, which in effect is the flux from my source divided by the flux, sorry, the flux on my target divided by the flux from my source. Uh, it's not a very efficient design. It's only about 26.3% efficient. So I'd really want to try to optimize this, but I'm going to leave that for a separate uh, video or webinar. This is just a rough demo to show you some of the setup tools. Uh, in addition to this irradiance map here, if I turn off my ray display, I could go to analysis, 3D irradiance illuminance. And now I can see that irradiance and illuminance directly on the surface in the model here. So I haven't traced a lot of rays, so the map here, the plot is a little noisy, uh, but we can see where the higher irradiance values are along the edges here. So we can use this tool to see that distribution right on the surfaces. Uh, makes for a nice way to see where's the light hitting uh, quite easily. Now another way to set up a light source is we could set up a surface source property. So in this model, I have an object here that I'm using as my quote unquote sun. Uh, and I just placed it, I think it's, let me, it's about 600 millimeters away. You know, it doesn't need to be placed 93 million miles away. Uh, it just needs to be, you know, because we're modeling the angular distribution, we just want to keep it out of the way of the model. So I have my object here and I'm going to turn it on again, using that, changing that red X to a green check mark. And my front surface is right here. And I'm just going to go right click properties. And I'm going to pick surface source. And I want to use the emission type of a source property. There's one thing that's built into trace pro is a, a pre-built solar source. So I'm going to scroll down here to solar. Uh, solar sources, and I can pick sun. Now what's loaded in the background in this surface source property is a um, spectrum of the sun. It's an ASTM model of the solar spectrum, as well as the angular distribution of the sun. So I can pick that. It's automatically now loaded into the software. I can pick my wavelengths. So for example, I could click here my 0.5461. But if I also wanted to look at, let's say, 0.8 microns, I could click that. And we can see here that the, the weight, the output is adjusted based on that solar spectrum. So there's not quite twice the output at, at 0.5461 as there is at 0.8 microns. And we could add as many wavelengths in there as we want. Uh, just to be consistent with my previous one, I'm going to trace 100,000 rays. I'm going to click apply. And one thing I want to do, because I just changed my sources, is I want to go over here to my source tab and turn off my grid source. So that grid source won't be used. Now we're just going to use our surface source property here. Run that. It's going to go through the audit process again. It's a little bit quicker this time since we didn't really change any geometry. And I'm going to redo my ray sorting here. So I'm going to go analysis, ray sorting, turn my ray display back on. So I have that. Or if I turn my ray display off, I could look at things like my, my 3D irradiance maps. 
just like before. And our results will be similar because we traced roughly the same sources, although I did use 0.8 microns in this one, so there might be some slight differences. So that's the sort of the basics on setting up a solar collector in TracePro. Again, just apply your properties, set up your model, run, set up your sources, and, and do your analysis. Um, one thing I am going to do here is I'm going to turn off my 3D irradiance map. Otherwise, every time I click on another surface, it's going to show up, um, re recalculate that. So I don't need that right now. So, so I'm going to jump back to my notes here for a few seconds. And just a reminder, we already do have some questions. So again, please feel free, send in questions as we're going along. So we're going to talk a little bit now about the solar emulator. Uh, the solar emulator is a tool that's been in TracePro for a number of years now. Uh, it's one that, that not everybody knows is there. So I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of an updated view. Uh, we do have a webinar on it, and I'm probably going to do another webinar at some point soon on just the solar emulator, or at least a training video on it. So when we set up the solar emulator, we're going to start with the fact that in TracePro, we already have a model here. We have a, a system we're working with, and we wanna see how this system performs as we move the sun across the sky or as we change our locations. So we wanna model different parameters, but we wanna set it up so that it models it sort of automatically. We don't have to go in and build each individual sun position. So let me go back there. So we're gonna start off when we do the solar emulator, is that we're going to define our location and time period. And I'll show you all this in a few minutes here. We're going to define our location and time period. We're going to set up the parameters for direct and indirect sunlight. Um, we can use one or the other or both. We need to define a few terms uh, when we set this up. Things like zenith and north directions, pupil location and orientation, pupil shape, pupil size. And when we get there, I'll explain just what pupil means uh, in this application. Then we can set up in the sort of the last tab, we can set up our time interval. How many time segments do we want to run throughout the day? Our detector name, file path, file prefix, and time filters. And then we can run the analysis. And I'm going to, I forgot to go back to full screen here. Sorry about that. So here's where you find the solar emulator in TracePro. You can go to the tools menu and then go to solar emulator. Uh, and for people using different editions of TracePro, uh, the solar emulator is in all editions of TracePro. So it's in LC standard and expert. And here's what you see when you open it up. You st we start off here with this uh, Google map. So you do need, you'll only see this if you are connected to the internet. Uh, if you're not connected to the internet at the time, you can still use the op, use the emulator, but you just won't see the map location. So with that, I'm going to jump back over to the to the emulator here and back to TracePro, and we'll talk. I'll just, it's a little easier to show than just kind of giving out a bunch of slides. I prefer to kind of demo demonstrate it live. So our first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up, well, first thing I want to do is I want to check my sizes here. You know, how big is this collector? So I'm going to use the measure tool in TracePro. I'm going to click measure, and I'm going to go here to here. And this is telling me it's about, uh, where is my distance here? It's about 75 millimeters, just a little over 75 millimeters there, because oh, I picked the outer edges. So we'll use 75 millimeters as our, our width. If I then go from here to here, I pick the outside edges that time instead of the inside. It's 500 millimeters long. So our target is going to be 75 by 500. But another thing I'm interested in is the location, the, the Y value for this point. It's at about 24.2. So that's where I'm going to aim my rays. It's right at the, the entrance of this uh, collector. And that will make a little more sense in a few minutes why I want those numbers. So I'm going to go back here and let's open that up. So tools, solar emulator. 
And here we go. So I've picked my location as Boston, since that's close to where I live. But I could pick, for example, Madrid or Rome. Looks like Madrid showed me in the ocean. Must be just off the coast. But, you know, Rome. But I'm going to go back to Boston. That's where I live. Okay. Now we've picked a location quite easily. We have drop down menus here. You can also enter in um, if you have the, the longitude and latitude coordinates, you can enter new locations and add them at any time. So you're not limited to our drop down list. You can put new cities in anytime you want. And the next thing I need to do is set my time period. When do I want this uh, analysis to cover? What range of time? So I'm going to click here and I'm going to say today. And we're going to start at 7 a.m. And my ending point is going to be today at 7 p.m. So we'll go from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. today, Wednesday, June 3rd. And you can pick any day in the past, any day in the future. I'm going to come to my next tab here, which is my sources. And this is where we can set up the light sources. Uh, we can pick, do we want direct sunlight, indirect sunlight, both, one or the other. Uh, in this case, I'm only going to use direct sunlight. And I could give it my solar constant. What's my irradiance value? So let's say it's 1,000 watts per meter squared. The sun distance setting is how far is this going to be away from the model in Trace Pro. So I'm going to do it here. We want it to be up high enough so it doesn't crash into the model as it's moving around. So let's say something like 5,000 millimeters, five meters away, and then a ray number. Uh, normally, I would set this number fairly high, 10,000, 100,000 million rays. But for purposes of a demo, I'm going to set it low so the ray trace runs a little quicker. Uh, normally, I would not use 1,000 rays for an analysis. Uh, but for, for speed's sake here, I'll do it. If you also want to model diffuse skylight, we have a couple different options here. The Agawa All Sky Model, where you can pick things like clear, clear sky, partly cloudy, overcast, custom. Or the Darula Kittler models, things like partly cloudy with bright circumsolar region, white blue sky with direct solar corona. So these are all options that you can add in as well if you want to add in that diffuse sunlight as well. And they're actually added in typically as, as a file source in TracePro. So when you start the analysis, it's going to insert a source to be the direct sunlight and then insert a second file source to be the indirect or diffuse sunlight. But again, for simplicity's sake here, we're going to do just direct sunlight. And then I'm going to come to my third tab, which is the, the one where when people are first using this optimizer, or this emulator, uh, this is the one where they, they sort of run into the most confusion. So we're going to spend a few bits, a few uh, seconds here going over this. Oh, and I forgot to mention back here, when you're in the first setup, the Google map, if you click trajectory, it'll actually show you the track of the sun across the sky. So you can verify, you know, are you starting before dawn or continuing past, um, or continuing past uh, sunset or things like that. So you can set that up. So we go to the system setup tab here. And the first thing I need to do is set up my zenith and north. So zenith is going to be what's the up direction. So in this case, my zenith, if I look at my Trace Pro model, is going to be along the y-axis. And I'm going to set my north, I think, believe, along the, along the z-axis. So north will be off in this direction, and zenith is up here. So let's go back here. So zenith is going to be 0, 1, 0. We're using the same direction vectors like we do in TracePro quite quite often. And north will be 0, 0, 1. Oops, 0, 0, 1, not 0. So that sets my, my zenith direction. So what's going to be up, what's going to be north. I'm going to come back in a few minutes 
after this initial demo, I'm going to show you what the system components and the sun tracking is all about. Uh, I'm going to leave my system origin at zero for now. That relates to the sun tracking option. But I do need to set my pupil center. And the pupil center can be thought of as the entrance aperture. Where is the light going to be aimed? And back when I measure, made a measurement a few minutes ago of the model in Trace Pro, the pupil center was at 24.2 millimeters. And it was centered in the origin. You know, if we look back here, it's, it's centered on X and Z. So 0, 24.2, 0. My pupil normal is going to be a value, a, a vector that's normal to that pupil or entrance aperture. So in this case, it coincides with the zenith direction. And my pupil up will correspond to the north as well. So 0, 0, 1. You can change these. Sometimes this pupil normal might need to change if, let's see, do I have a drawing tool here? I do. Let's say we were modeling light on a building. It looked like this. Excuse my poor drawing skills. But the zenith direction might be up there, but we want a model light hitting the side of this building here. So we'd set our pupil normal to be normal to that side of the building. So sometimes the the zenith value and the norm, pupil normal will be different. Uh, in my particular case, they're actually the same. Okay. So my pupil up, pupil normal there. And last thing are going to be my pupil size. And I want it to be rectangular. My detector is rectangular. My width is going to be 500. And my height is 75. So 500 by 75, my pupil normal, my pupil width and size. And hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, somebody please make a comment and we can come back to it again at the end of the webinar. But we're basically setting up the size, location, and orientation of the entrance aperture, which in this case corresponds to the entrance to the solar collector. And lastly, I'm going to go to my analysis tab here. I can set my intervals. Uh, the default setting here is every 30 minutes. I don't want that. I want it to be every hour. I need to give it my detector. What surface in the Trace Pro model am I looking for my results on? So receiver, that's my surface name from the Trace Pro model. I do advise when you're doing something like this, whether you're in the solar emulator or the um, interactive optimizer or the texture optimizer, uh, your surfaces of interest, give them a unique name. So that, that there's, for example, there's only one surface in the model named receiver. Uh, you don't want to use things like surface one, surface two, because there's multiple surface one, surface twos in the model. So we want to give it a unique name so that the program knows where to look. Uh, then I can click my save path. Where do I want to save my results? And I'm going to go on my PC here and scroll down to Solar Emulator. And for today's webinar. So all my results will be saved there. So after I do this, I can go back to that folder and look at the results. I can pull up things like the irradiance maps and stuff like that. And then I can give it a prefix. I'm going to call it morning one for the, the morning webinar session. And with that, I can actually click start. And what this is going to do is it's going to start at 7 a.m. for today in Boston, run a ray trace, move the sun to where it would be in at the next time interval, which is 8, 8 a.m., and repeat the process all the way through to 7 p.m. I did just notice one thing I want to change. I want to turn off my sun model here. I don't need that object because the, the, the emulator is going to put in its own sun model. So I don't want to be tracing two sun models there. So I'll turn that off. So I'm going to start here. And I'm not going to let this run through the whole way. It, it would take a little bit of time. Uh, but we can see up top here, 
we have the different time intervals and we have our total flux here going along. And we'll see as we as we are going to expect, you know, as we get closer to noon time, our flux is going to go up and then it'll start to drop off. So we're getting up to here's 11 a.m. We're running now. Let it run another iteration or two just to kind of show the results. Starting to level off now that we're coming past through noon. And then starting to drop off in the afternoon. So this is a fixed sun position. I mean, a fixed collector position. So we expect this type of performance. So I'm going to stop this here. So that's a quick way to model, you know, the sun through different positions. If we actually click here, here's our sun up over here. Now that sun model down onto that system. Okay. So we can change now. I, I want to show you a different little tool that's in this solar em emulator. Uh, I'm going to delete this. I don't really have to. It'll do it automatically in the next run. But let's say we were going to install a tracking apparatus to this solar collector. We want it to track the sun. Well, we can model that in the solar emulator. And what I can do to, to do that is I'm going to come back here to my system setup tab. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change solar tracking from none to aim to sun. And we can set a tolerance, you know, what kind of tolerance is it going to have in aiming to the sun? Three degrees is the default value. We'll leave that as is. Okay, so now we're going to tell this as we go through the process, we want to aim towards the sun. But we need to tell the, the emulator here, what are we actually aiming towards the sun? So that's where this system components part comes in. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to click here and I'm going to type in detector. Click add and then concentrator and click add. So this tells this now that the parts that are going to move are the detector and the concentrator. And one last change we need to make. I mentioned this system origin here briefly a few minutes ago. The system origin is the origin of rotation. Where are we going to rotate about? And in this model, I decided to rotate just a little bit below the, the concentrator here. So it's at about minus two for Y. So system origin is zero, minus two, zero. So that's going to be my center of rotation. I can come here, I can come back to analysis. I want to keep my time interval the same, one hour. My target's the same, detector, renamed receiver. Uh, the only thing different I'm going to do is I'm going to change my file prefix. So if I wanted to look at these in the future, I'd have a different prefix on the file. I'm not overwriting my existing data. So very simple changes. Turn on sun tracking, put in the components you want to use here, and then set your origin of rotation, your center of rotation and click start. So it's very much the same process. It's sending over the sun for 7 a.m. But now what's different is each time it makes that change, it aims the collector and the detector towards the sun. So we're going to see a little bit different result this time. And again, I won't let this run the whole way here. But one thing we're going to notice is that the values, you know, it looks like a big change here, but we're actually changing from our total flux from about a little over 9.7 watts down to about 9.4 watts. So it's a small change in the flux, whereas before there was actually a very large change in the flux from the beginning of the day to midday towards the end of the day. So we're actually controlling that and tracking that quite well. Let me see if I can rotate this model here a little bit so we can see it. We can see the model rotating here in Trace Pro for each iteration. There it goes again. And if we come back to our results, 
so we're still staying in this relatively narrow band here of uh, collection. So we're doing a good job of tracking. So this utility, this tracking gives you the ability to model those systems where you do have the capability to have the collector track with the, uh, with the sun. Okay. There's one other thing I wanted to demonstrate here in this emulator now uh, before we move on. And that is there's an, an option here for time filter. And what the time filter lets you do is it lets you set, if you want to do a ray trace over multiple days, multiple months, multiple years, for example, you could see the performance of the system throughout the course of a, you know, a larger time period than let's say just, you know, June 3rd, 7 a.m. 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So for example, I want, if I wanted to look at this system over the course of a year, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back here and I'm going to pick January 1st and noontime. January 1st, 2020. And I'm going to go here. I'm going to go to January 1st, 2021. And we'll set that to noontime as well. So noon on the 1st till noon on the on the 1st of 2021 over the course of a year. I just want to go back here. My model is going to be back in its original position here. I'm going to delete that. Delete my son there. Don't need that. Okay. And let's go back to the optimizer here, the emulator. I'm going to turn off tracking. I don't want this to track in this case. I just want to see the results if there is no tracking. Uh, everything else I'll stay the same. But the other change that I want to make is I can use this time filter. And I'm going to change this time filter here to, I'll type it out and then go back through what I'm doing. So the first two values are the the year and the date, the year and the month. And the last one is the date. So I want to look at any month and any year and the 15th. Um, and because I've used these stars, it's actually going to use these months here, January 1, 2020 to January 1, 2022, 2021. And the 12 is the time of the day. So what this allows me to do now is see the results of this system on the 15th of each month at noontime. So I can do that here, click start. Uh, if I didn't want to overwrite my files, I just would have needed to change my file prefix, but it's okay to do right now. And oops, I made one mistake, excuse me. Because I want to do it, I want my interval here. I forgot to do this the last time I did this as well. I want to set my interval to, to once a day. So it's going through in one day steps instead of one hour steps throughout the day. So I'll restart that. Uh, nice thing about this, if you see the mistake, you can stop it pretty quick and just restart the process. So first ray trace was January 15th, 2020. February 15th, 2020. And this isn't going to show me the results just yet until I change this here to per year. Uh, this is my, my window display here. It was set on per day, which is the, the best setting if you're looking over the performance of a single day. But I'm looking at the performance over a year, so I want to have a wider range on my graph here. And we'll just let this run through a little bit more. But we can see as we come up through May and now into June, you know, our, our values are changing and we're getting, you know, better results. So easy way to look at the performance over the course of a larger time frame if you want. We'll stop that. Okay. So just a couple things that, um, so a couple things that are, you know, that are in the solar emulator that, that not a lot of people know that are there or may not have had much experience with. So with that, I'm going to switch gears here again. 
and I'm going to look at a different model. And I'm going to go back to my notes first. So now I'm going to talk about a different tool in Trace Pro. In this case, I want to talk about the, the, the interactive optimizer. And we have a lot of videos on the interactive optimizer on our website, and we're always adding more. But I wanted to give you a quick demo on setting it up for a solar concentrator or a solar collector, as well as in my next set of my next set of notes, a little feature that's really I think underused in the uh, in the optimizer as well. So our workflow, and I've been trying to put this you know similar workflow through for each one of these steps. But we're going to define the initial collector. We'll define variables and optimization operands. Um, set up the model. I'll talk about the model in Trace Pro. Run the initial ray trace to verify the settings and then optimize the design. So fairly simple set of steps. So my model in this case, I did this a little bit differently. Uh, this is a model I built a number of years ago. Uh, this is a model that has multiple sun positions. Uh, it so happens, I think it was the middle of July in Detroit from like 20, 000, 2009. So it's been around for a little while, with some of my examples. But I just used the, the NREL, National Renewable Energy Labs website, to find the sun's position, the azimuth and zenith angles at from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., similar range to I just used, in one hour in intervals. And I made a model with all those different positions. As you can probably guess, this was made before we had the solar emulator but I've had it sitting around on my computer for quite a while. So each of these would have the ability, we could turn them on one at a time and trace and see the results. So for example, I have a concentrator or a collector here. I could run a ray trace. Uh, over here, just notice I only have the noonday sun turned on. All these others are turned off. I can run a ray trace. And let me see here. I may have ray sorting turned on. So let's see. Look at my target. Check one thing. Oh, okay. I forgot to turn my noonday sun back on here. The surface source. There we go. Okay. So we have our light hitting our collector and coming down here to our receiver and I could look at my inner radiance map and 31 and a half percent it's not very efficient um, the only thing I did here the only sort of optimization in terms of position was I, I aimed it roughly at the noonday sun so it, it's roughly aimed at about that the elevation of the sun there but it's, it's not designed to be perfect now if I want to optimize this I can go to my interactive optimizer uh, this tool, the Interactive Optimizer, is limited to TracePro Standard and Expert. So I'm going to come down here to Optimize Interactive. And I'm going to open up that file. I've already done the initial work on this. But here's my, my initial collector. Um, it's about 80 millimeters deep. It's a solid, uh, solid glass collector in this case and it has two variables this here is a spline control point so it can move left or right so it can change the curvature of the sides and I also have a conic control up here on the top where this thing can move up and down to act sort of like a, a, a spherical lens I've, I've constrained it to be a circular conic so this can move up and down to act as a lens on the top so it doesn't need to be flat um, and the, the conic, it has a curvature variation here. These are the, the range, minus 0.02 to plus 0.02. And this one here has a range of about plus, minus 15 to plus 50 millimeters. So quite a large range. Uh, I turned that into a solid object down here in the object view. And again, for more exact steps or all the the precise steps. Take a look at some of our optimizer videos. It goes through this uh, a little more in detail. But I used a rotational symmetry on this to revolve that. 
and I gave it a BK7 glass property shot BK7. So nothing too fancy there. I wanted to try to keep it simple for this demo. And lastly, I'm going to go to my optimization window here. And what I'm going to do now is here's my, my variables. Those are defined from those variable positions in the optimizer. Here's my concentrator, the radial symmetry, shot BK7. And in terms of a, an operand or a goal, I set this to be flux. So I want flux or power that's located on my detector down here. So I have a detector down here at the end of the concentrator and the surface is named receiver. So again, very straightforward to set up. And I, the only thing a little different that some people don't always use, but for my optimization option here, I use normalize, meaning it's the percentage of the total flux. So that means my target value can be from zero to one. So I set this at one. I wanna to try to get 100% of the flux. I won't, but that's my goal. Uh, and as with most of our utilities, you need to set some paths and prefixes where we're gonna save the files. I'm gonna call this morning one, and then I can start the process. And what this is going to do is it's going to run the ray trace, send over the object, run the ray trace, analyze the results, compare it to my goal, which you know is 100% flux, and it's gonna generate an error value. And it's gonna go through trying to, um, trying to reduce that error value down to zero. So we can actually see down here, the shape is changing each time. If I go back to that optimization log here, this opens up automatically. If I click on trend chart, it shows me the error value versus the iteration count. And we're gonna let this just run a couple more iterations here. Uh, this red bar shows the best result at any time. So right now, iteration 20, now 21, it's kind of getting to the point where each one is a little bit better than the previous. I won't let it go too much longer. We'll just go here and then we'll stop this. Okay, so I'm gonna stop this. And again, normally I would let that run for a longer period of time, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop that now. But I can update my model here. I can click on this iteration. I can right click, go to update the model, say yes. There's my concentrator. It actually did have, add some curvature to the top there. I can rerun my ray trace. And if I look at my target, my receiver, I have my rays turned off, but already it looks much better. And I could look at my irradiance map. And we're now up to just over 90% efficiency. So within maybe two or three minutes, we optimized this design from about 30 or 32% efficiency up to 90%. So, you know, not a bad use of time to, to get there. And I think if I let it run, it would get a little bit higher, but you know, I am dealing with some reflection losses and stuff for now reflection losses. So I wouldn't expect it to be too much over, you know, 92, 95% at most. Okay, last topic for today. And what we're gonna do now is, let's say we wanted to have a concentrator like this, and we didn't wanna have a track but we wanna to try to optimize it for a wider time period. You know, in this case, I optimized it to one time, noon time. But let's say I wanna optimize this to 10 a.m., noon time, and 2 p.m. So what's sort of the best compromise design we can get? So the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna turn on 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. So now I have three sun sources here. It's basically, this is 10 a.m. here, noon time, 2 p.m. over here. So minor change in the Trace Pro model. We'll do a zoom all here so it's a little easier to see. 
So again, none of these other sun positions are going to be used at this time. We'll just use those those three positions. But let's go back to the to our notes here for a second. I'll walk you through the settings. So again, this is op I call it optimizing a fixed collector, fixed position collector for multiple positions. Um, and we go through a lot of the similar steps as we just did for the for that um, single sun position. Define the initial collector and the optimizer. Define the variables and operands. Um, excuse me while I fix a quick spelling mistake. There we go. Okay. Uh, set up the model in Trace Pro, which is what I just did. I could sort of uh, skipped ahead a step here, but I set up the model to include my sources and detectors. And the new step here is we need to set up the source configuration tool in the interactive optimizer. We have the ability to tell the optimizer what light sources to use. And I'll show you that here in just a second. And here's an, exa here's an example of this, what it looks like. Here's the, the three different sun positions. And in this case, I traced them all three at the same time. The, the optimizer will actually trace them one at a time. But afterwards, I went through, traced all three of them. And here's our collector and our detector down here. So this is what we're trying to do, is we're trying to get the best compromise collector for these three different sun positions. Okay. And I will like, for those that are faint of heart, I will give you a warning. There is going to be macro language ahead. Uh, it's rather simple, but I know there are some people who do not like macro language. So I'll do my best to explain it, and we'll keep it pretty simple. But just as a heads up. Uh, this is actually the macro code we're going to use. And I'll show it to you in the optimizer. Um, basically, we're doing, we're turning on and off what's called the ray trace flag. And if you remembered back early on in this webinar, I talked about this red X and green check mark. That's called the ray trace flag. So that's what tells us if we're going to use something or not during a ray trace. So here, what I'm actually doing is using macro commands to turn the ray trace flag on and off. So for source configuration one, set the ray trace flag for the entity get by name, one of my favorite scheme macro commands, entity get by names, 10 a.m. sun, and the, the emitting surface is called emitter, and it's pound or hashtag T. So we're turning on the 10 a.m. sun emitter surface, and we're turning off the emitting surface for noontime sun and 2 p.m. sun. And then we're running a ray trace. For source configuration two, we'd turn on the noontime and turn off 10 and 2. And then for source, source configuration three, we'd do the same thing, just turn on 2 and turn off 10 and noon. So rather simple, but it is worth, you know, it's one of those cases where knowing a little bit of the macro language really helps you improve and increase the capability of the tool. Okay. Okay, so let me show you that quickly in Trace Pro. We're starting to run a little, little bit long here. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to close out this. And I'm going to open up a variation of this. It's just my multiple sources version. So it's the same starting position. But the only difference is here in the operands is I've now set three operands. And what changes between them, these are still flux operands. Um, each one of them I set to 0.333 just so it's one third the flux. Uh, but I am looking at a different source configuration for each one. And here's that source configured configuration editor here. And here's source configuration one, which is turning on the 10 a.m. sun. Source two turns on just the noontime sun. Source three turns on just the 2 p.m. sun. So you can actually cut and paste the macro commands. And we can add in as many configurations as we, as we want. But I'm just saying here for source configuration one, that's my goal. Source configuration two, that's my goal. Source configuration three, that's my goal. 
and basically it's the same process. I'm going to click start. It's going to ask you if I want to delete those. That's okay. And the one thing we'll see different here in Trace Pro is each iteration, you're going to see it go from that sun to that sun. You're going to see it trace three different suns. So three different sources being ray traced for each iteration. And we'll come back here. And again, looking at the looking at the trend chart and the optimization log, we can see where's the best one going to be. Right now, it's at, at number eight. So I'm not going to let this run. We're we're getting close on time here. I don't want to keep everybody too long for the day. Uh, but just to, the ability to show you that we can trace more than one source, and we can use multiple sources and try to you know figure out what's the best compromise doing that. So I'm going to stop that. Okay, and we'll go back to the notes and just kind of wrap this up. And I see we've got a good number of questions, so please feel free to keep sending them in. Okay. And let's go sort of wrap this up and get to some questions. Okay, so quick summary. Uh, in Trace Pro, there's a lot of tools for analyzing and optimizing solar applications. Um, we can use it to analyze existing or new solar collectors. Uh, the solar emulator is a great tool for modeling the performance of a system in different locations and time periods, uh, including tracking if you are doing tracking. And then uh, you can also use the interactive optimizer to optimize um, a variety of solar collectors, whether they're concentrate, you know, solid concentrators like the one I just showed. I could use the optimizer to, to optimize that um, trough concentrator I used as my first example. So a lot of capabilities in that optimizer. Um, what I'm going to plan on doing with this is probably break this down into some smaller, uh, more focused tutorial videos to, to walk through each step of each system. This today was intended as more of a, a wide overview of all the different capabilities. I should mention that if anybody's is looking for more information, uh, please contact us at lambdares.com. That's our website or our phone number 978 in the US, so uh, country code 1001, I believe. So 978-486-0766. Um, and our email is sales at Lambda Res. And we do also offer free 14-day trials for qualified users, uh, including tech support. So we'd be able to go through and answer any questions you'd have during your evaluation. Uh, so let me take a look at some of the questions. Uh, judging by the number of questions, I'm probably not going to get to all of them here. But any questions I do not get to, I will respond by email um, to those. So let's start off. Um, so we mentioned our training section isn't showing anything right now. And that's because really our, our on-site trainings, you know, either in our, our facility or in um, other places, is kind of up in the air right now with the whole... Uh, coronavirus COVID-19 situation. So we haven't finalized dates there yet, but as soon as we do, we will get that up there. Uh, is there a library definition of solar spectra? Um, we have a fixed solar spectrum predefined in TracePro. I forget the exact one it is. It's an ASTM model. It's in the manual, uh, but we also have the ability using the surface source property generator utility in TracePro to let you add in any solar profile that you want. Um, so we can certainly add in, you could, a user could build up a solar library quite quickly. Um, could we use optical fibers in solar illumination in TracePro? Yes, quite easily. Uh, you could put a solar fiber, um, I, I've looked at some applications, things like solar surgery using collectors and fibers to deliver the light. Uh, so quite easy to do. Um, so a question here, a little more general question about the number of pixels in the um, irradiance and luminance maps, uh, how to decide the number of pixels. And usually what I do is um, it's going to depend on the resolution you want. You know, the more pixels, the higher the resolution. Um, the fewer pixels, the lower the resolution. And the question is also about that there's a considerable change in the maximum value of irradiance, irradiance or illuminance when you do that. And if you see that, if you increase the resolution, increase the number of pixels, 
and you see a big change in the irradiance values, it's a good indicator you need to trace more rays. You know, the map is noisy at that point. Certain pixels are getting more flux than others, and the irradiance in the irradiance map is calculated by the pixel area divided by the, um, sorry, the, the flux in the pixel divided by the pixel area. So if you were to keep the flux constant, like this one ray hitting a pixel, and divide it by a smaller and smaller area, your irradiance value is going to go up. So usually what I say when you see a situation like that is either go with the lower resolution if you want to stay with a small number of rays, or if you need the higher resolution, you're just going to have to go and trace more rays. There's really no way around that. Uh, is the sun source collimated? Uh, no, the, the solar source options in TracePro, both in the grid source and in the surface source property, have that half degree solar angle, roughly plus or minus 0.25 degrees. So that's built in. So how to define on axis or one axis tracking? So we can do that. There's a couple questions about tracking here. So let me go back here, see if I can clean those up. So there is an option for on sun tracking, for example, uniaxial, and what you need to define is the rotation axis. So in this case, 0, 0, 1 would be rotating about the Z axis. You know, in my previous model, I probably want my rotation angle to be about the X axis, rotate about the way it is in and out of the screen here. I don't think I'd want to rotate it about the Z. But you can set that rotation axis using the uniaxial. And you can set things like where you're starting and the number of degrees per hour that you want to rotate at. Uh, most of the solar are stationary collectors, but like in the case of heliostat, the collector is not stationary. It tracks the movement of the sun during the day. How can I track the sun using a heliostat? Um, well, like a heliostat, you can use the tracking here. Uh, you can also write macros. Um, to move, let's say, if the heliostat is fixed and you have a field of mirrors, then what you get into is you have to write macros to tip those mirrors to point at the solar collector. Uh, so it, it gets a little bit more into the macro language in TracePro, uh, but it is something that we can do. Uh, can we define more than one pupil? Uh, no, at present we can only have one pupil. So if you have one pupil or entrance aperture, so if you need more, you need to just repeat the process. Run the emulation or the, or the simulation for one pupil, change the pupil, run it again, and then you could look at the um, look at the, the results there. Uh, can I explain a little bit more about the zenith and normal with respect to the pupil? Well, they are sort of independent terms here. The zenith and normal let me turn my pen back on here, is going to define what's the up direction or the zenith direction in the model and what's the north direction. And those stay fixed. Okay? The pupil is the entrance of this detector here or of this collector. Let me turn my pen back on. So that this is the pupil. It's the entrance aperture of this here. And that can have its own size, and it can also have its own normal and up direction. So, for example, if my pupil up is aimed this way, you know, I get this rectangular orientation this way. If I aim it this way, my pupil would actually be rotated in the wrong direction. Uh, the other way, as I mentioned, for using the changing the pupil normal, where it might not match the zenith, is if you're looking at light hitting the side of a building. We want to change it so that the pupil normal always wants to be at a right angle to the entrance aperture. Okay. Uh, what type of surface from surface list can be used to draw a parabolic and compound parabola in the, op in the optimizer? The easiest way to do a CPC, um, well, there is a couple options here. Let me erase my drawings here. Turn off the pen. We do have options, for example, reflectors and conic reflectors. So here you can have a conic reflector and you can set that to be a parabola. Uh, basically you're setting here what's your conic constant. So for example, I could set it to be parabolic. 
and it's way out of, let me do this, let me move it so it's a, so it's a realistic parabola. That's just, my values are way off, so excuse me here. I let that one get away from me a little bit. Oops, continue. Oh, I did something it didn't like, so let me. So we do have an option for a conic reflector there. Um, there's also the option for doing a true CPC. What I normally do is I use the macro command for inserting a parabolic concentrator um, into here. Uh, again, a little more detail than what I want to try to cover in this webinar, but it is quite easy to do. Uh, is it possible to import the CAD drawing into the optimizer? Uh, not at this point, no. You have to make the, optim make the object here in the optimizer that you want to optimize. And let me just see if there's any other ones that are kind of. Could you use the optimization tool to find the best azimuth angle instead of the best receiver shape? Um, yes, you can use the macro language. For example, I could use the macro language to rotate an existing concentrator towards the sun and find out where it's going to collect the most sun. Uh, we, we do that using these after scheme commands down here in the optimizer. So that's a good question. Yes, it can be done. Um, how to simulate the optical efficiency of the collector? Well, you could do that by, my collector, I, I defined it as um, a perfect absorber, 100% efficiency or 100% absorption. You could quite easily change that, put a surface property on there that has a given a, absorption given collect given reflection or transmission so if you do have a, a um, if you do have a list or sorry you do have the ability to define that receiver as a collection of, or as a uh, collection of um, absorption and reflection and transmission points quite easily how do you get from the emulator list to the sun positions from the optimizer you don't the optimize the, the solar emulator does not talk to the to the solar uh, the solar emulator does not talk directly to the um, 3D interactive optimizer. That's why in this example here, I made my own fixed sun positions. And that way, I could do it that way. So at this point in time, we can't link the solar emulator and the uh, the 3D optimizer. You need to set up your sun positions if you're doing the 3D optimizer like this and then use the source configurations to turn one, turn them on one at a time. And there's a few other questions, but uh, we're getting to the point where about 10 minutes past where I was thinking we're going to stop. So any other questions I'm going to address e via email. Um, but I'd like to, at that point, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, we did run fairly long today, so thank you for your, your time. I hope everybody found that it was an interesting topic. Um, as I mentioned, it was, um, we did record this session, or we're still recording it. So this recording will be available on our website uh, probably within the next day or so. Uh, so with that, thank you, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Have a good day.